How's it going, everybody? Good? Great. Awesome. Try and make it quick so everybody can get on with their day. So this is a project title called Development of Design Recommendations for Hooked Bar Lap Splices. This is my PhD research, or this is just a small portion of it which I'm going to be going through today, trying to be somewhat practical with everybody's time. I'm not going to get too much into the weeds of testing and things like that. Um, but this was funded by the Virginia Department of Transportation. They recently just finished a project, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Expansion Project, where they spent $2.3 billion on it, and they ended up using lots of hooked bars and lap splices, mainly in their bridge substructure elements. Came to find out at the time that there wasn't really any research out there on it for large bars and large elements. Went ahead to spend the $2 billion and then went back after the fact to figure out whether it was safe. So that's my job. So anyway, that's what we're going into today. So this is actually two pictures from the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Expansion Project. And the basically the problem that they were running into is that these precast bend caps that they were using, which were about 150 feet long or something to that effect, they were trying to build them in precast, you know, staging the construction and accelerated bridge construction. These caps are four and a half feet wide by four and a half feet deep. You're going to put big bars in there to get a reasonable reinforcement ratio. Eight, nines, elevens, things of that nature. You start taking a number 11 bar and you look at what's the splice length required in this type of application, you could be staring at five, six feet. Okay, they don't want to do that. They don't want a five or six foot gap. They want this thing to be short, compact, minimal cast in place, concrete construction, keep moving, right? And so the approach they came to address that was to say, hey, rather than take straight bars, let's just take hook bars and then splice them under the auspices that if I can develop a bar with a hook in a shorter distance than a straight bar, why can't I splice a hook over a shorter distance than a straight bar? Came to find out there's not really a lot, any literature on that for large bars, went ahead and did it anyway, and then that's kind of where we're at right now. And so what we're trying to do is to develop some sort of design recommendation that VDOT could put in their code of practice or maybe even ASHTO um, to give better guidance if this ever happens in the future. It happens to be there's actually a lot of applications which one might want to use this predominantly in precast concrete construction. So in, build, in bridges, you might have that cap-to-cap -cap or beam-to-beam -beam application. Um, this is widely used in deck panels and a lot of DOTs, albeit the ball, bars are smarter, uh, smaller, like fours and fives. It's actually even alluded to in some building construction as well. Um, that's actually a snip from ACI 318, Chapter 18 in the bottom right, which is a precast moment frame. I don't know if it was the intention to show that, but that looks like a hook bar lap splice to me in the bottom right. And people have even done literature on this. That was one paper from 2014 where they're using that in a precast moment frame. All I'm trying to say is there's applications where people might care about this, both in bridges and buildings. And so to develop a design approach for determining how long do these splices need to be, we predominantly relied on experimental tests of large-scale beam specimens. Um, a typical test that people do in bond literature for splices, they'll take a beam and they'll subject it to four-point bending. They'll put their lap splice in between those interior supports and that gets you a constant moment region. Um, and then, we're, so what we're doing is building two precast pieces with hooks sticking out, casting a closure joint, busting those beams. And when you end up, uh, you're the one of the birds at the top of the lab looking down, you get to see something kind of like that. Um, and so it's kind of a goofy looking failure mode. Um, we're going to go into actually why this occurs uh, in a minute because understanding what's actually the resistance mechanism of these joints is helpful then for establishing design criteria. Um, but we tested about 64 of these. I'm not going to read that long laundry list, but we looked at a ton of different stuff. Basically everything under the sun affects bond, so you got to go through all of it. Um, so if we start trying to rationalize how these things fail, here's another picture, very similar. Um, it has this very characteristic failure where these edge hooks on the left and on the right, they seem to kick out and it grabs a chunk of concrete and pulls it with it. Um, and so we start trying to think about that and rationalize what's actually going on in these joints. Um, and if you try to look on the right and resolve this into a strut and tie model, things start to make a little bit more sense. And so if we do a simplified strut and tie model where we want to develop tension in each one of those bars on the bottom and the top, we want to put tension in them. And in order to develop that tension in between bars, I'm going to have these struts that are spanning in between bars, right? And if I'm looking at an interior bar, I have a strut coming in on either side of the bar. I'm laterally stabilized. 
all honky-dory. If I go to an edge bar like that one all the way on the left of the drawing, I only have one strut framing into the node, okay? Now, these splices are typically non-contact because when these bars are buried in precast concrete, you need to have that tolerance so they don't hit each other in the field. So because of that eccentricity, you have an unresolved lateral component of that strut, which is trying to push the hook outwards. And so what ends up happening is if you don't have steel transverse to those lap bars, concrete's left to pick up the tension in the opposite direction. We know concrete doesn't like tension. And so what ends up happening is that tie will rupture, shown in red, causing the two hooked ends of the edge bars to kick outwards. And you get that rupture right along the uh, axis of the first interior bar where the concrete's already split. So you don't have a lot of capacity there to begin with. And so I bring this up because this is going to become relevant later when we start trying to think about what would be a rational way to design these splices. And so, like I said, we tested a bunch of these beams and, of course, had to then make a database for it to figure out what a design equation would look like. And so I'm just showing a summary of the test parameters within that database on the right. We took about 54 of our 64 tests we did at the lab. Some of them have some unusual like testing configurations, like we used fiber reinforced concrete, and we really didn't test enough of them to dial in on that. So we removed that to generally have the you know, basis for what we could then go ahead with. And so these are the test parameters that were left in the database, which were predominantly chosen because that's what VDOT was interested in. So what we wanted to then do is say, hey, can we just take one of the hooked bar development length equations that are in the code and use that to design these splices? And is that safe? That was the first thing, because that would be the simplest thing, just use something that's already out there, right? So we looked at three different equations, um, ACI 318.19, ASHTO 9th edition 2020, and ASHTO 10th edition is actually coming out soon. But these are the three development length equations in those codes shown on that middle column. The way that we're actually going to do this is in the lab, we pick the length and then we develop a stress in the bar. So to make that, these equations work for predicting that behavior in the lab, we actually just rearrange it to solve for stress as a function of lap length. And so all I'm showing on the right there is that we're going to use each of these equations by moving variables around to predict stress instead of just calculating a length. And so we can actually use this to then assess how well do each one of these equations work for the beam splice test that we did in the lab. And so the way we do this is by calculating so-called test to calculated stress ratios, which put simply is just saying, look, I busted a beam in the lab, it had got 50 KSI in it, that's FS. I took one of my equations, my equation says I can calculate, say, 40 KSI, so I take 50 divided by 40, that's a number, that's a test to calculated stress ratio. So for in this example, if I wanted to use the ninth edition of ASHTO, I could go ahead and do that calculate a ratio, and if I have a perfect agreement, meaning my calculation is exactly equal to strength, that would be a ratio of one. If I'm conservative, that would mean my denominator, my prediction is less than the experimental value, so that would be greater than one. If I'm unconservative, that value would similarly be less than one. And what ideally we'd want to do is have a equation that has very low spread, low COV, so it's very accurate all the time. And one of the ways that we can then use these to evaluate equations is to use, look at that graph on the right as an example. We can plot all of our test to calculated ratios of the given equation, so this would be ASHTO 9th edition, on the vertical axis, and then we plot that against a variable on the x-axis to see how well it works for that specific variable. So, for example, for bar size, we tested 6s, 9s, and 11s, and what you can see is that there's a negative trend line, meaning that ASHTO seems to be conservative for small bars, but then as you go to bigger bars, like number 11, the conservatism goes down as those values drop below 1. Okay? So that's how you interpret these plots. We can go ahead and play that game with all three of those models, ACI 318, the two versions of ASHTO, and I'm just plotting them on... Um, ACI is in one column, then ASHTO, then the other version of ASHTO, and I'm plotting those test to calculate stress ratio plots um, against bar diameter on the first row and splice length on the second row. And ideally, again, we'd want to see a horizontal trend line, meaning that there's not a preference for small bars, big bars, short splice lengths, long splice lengths, etc. Um, and I'm also showing at the top the mean test to calculate stress ratio and the coefficient of variation. And so this is where it all ends up landing. Each one of them has their own issue for whatever the reason. 
Um, so we didn't actually end up wanting to go with any of these. We wanted to see if we come up with a better equation, albeit ASHTO 10 does seem to be somewhat decent. It's got a COV of 13%, but we were curious to see if we could do any better. So anyway, uh, there's a bunch of statistics. I'm not going to get into that today. We did regression analysis and we ended up producing our own equation for the minimum required lap length of hooked bars. And we tried to make it look something similar to like what's shown in ACI, for example. And that's what ended up coming out of our regression analysis. These are showing our results here on the left. This is a slightly different graph. It's showing the calculated stress that we can get from that equation by reorganizing it again. And then on the x-axis, it's showing my experimental stresses, what I broke in the lab and was able to achieve. And so that diagonal solid line would be perfect agreement, but because we're trying to do something for code, we want to be below that line to have a factor of safety, right? So that's just what I'm showing there. Uh, coefficient of variation ended up being 7%, which is pretty good. So that's like half of the best of the other three, which was Ashto. So ended up being able to do a little bit better. Just to illustrate what some of these variables are, um, the lap length that we're measuring in the top left, that's from out to out of hooked bars in these splices. Um, this SL is the spacing, the center to center spacing of these splices, looking down on it. And then that cover term is just the minimum of the clear vertical and side cover to the bar if we took a cut through the beam. And so the only other thing then that's probably unusual is KTR. This is similar to the index that's in ACI 318 to reduce the splice length or development length based on transverse reinforcement. So we have something similar that we determined based on a regression that I'm actually going to go into. And then I'm actually going to show a design example on how this equation works. So this was basically the KTR term that we ended up calculating from regression. And it's pretty simple, actually. All you have to do is take 6.5 and multiply it by the number of legs on that bottom picture that are around the plane of that splice bar. And so we remember back when I was showing the strut and tie model, these things tend to fail by those edge hooks kicking out due to that transverse tension, that rupturing failure. And so what we're basically saying is, look, count the legs of all those steel that are going to pick up that tension, and that's going to then improve your anchorage strength. So we're going to do that, we're going to count that, and then we're going to multiply it by the area of one of those given legs. And so for my example down here, I'm showing four ties, each of which has one leg, right? And so one, two, three, four, n equals four, four times 6.5 is 26, and then multiply it by the area of one of those. And so if you're using a number three bar, that would be ATR1 is 0.11, it's a number four bar, 0.2, et cetera, okay? That's basically how to use the equation. So now what we actually want to see is go back to VDOT's design a couple years ago with some, a couple slight modifications, some of the uh, numbers, just to make the numbers look cleaner. But this is pretty similar to one of the design they actually ended up using for their bent cap, right? And so the question is, how long does that splice need to be if I want to use hooked bars? And I was going through this design using that equation. And so here are just some, an illustration of my parameters that I'm looking at here. And the way I would start this is say, look, I need to get 15 inches of steel. And so I'm actually going to use 10 pairs of splice number 11 bars, which basically gets me there. And then I've got to figure out how far I can space those bars in a given layer. So I go ahead and do that just using the width of the beam, the cover, and the fact that each splice has two bars, right? So I've got to make sure I have a two there on the denominator. And I end up getting that I can space these bars about three and a half inches on center. The next thing I want to do is I actually want to pick what should my transverse steel be to pick up some of that tension due to the eccentricity of the splice. And for now, I'm going to assume that I'm going to use five ties and space them at 3 dB to provide confinement to the concrete. And so what I can actually do then is if I have my strut and tie model there on the bottom right, I can use the spacing of the splice bars and the ties to calculate my strut angle theta. If I also then know the tension that I'm trying to develop in any one of those bars, that's just the area of a number 11 bar multiplied by the yield stress, I can go ahead and get that. And then I can just figure out what is the force I need to develop in any one of those ties by distributing that tension between four of my five ties. And the reason it's four is because you can see like that leftmost tie on the bottom, that node doesn't actually intersect the strut because it's non-contact. So it doesn't make sense to try to count on that to pick up any of that tension for the purpose of sizing the reinforcement. So I just split that tension using the 
four ties and my strut angle, and I end up getting that the area I have to have one of those ties is about 0.37 inches squared for the number 11 bar. So I can then just go ahead and say, okay, I'm going to use two number fours to get to that. I can calculate my KTR, um, and then I can calculate my confinement term, uh, the cover plus the transverse reinforcement, just like before. Um, I end up getting a number about 14, but our test date is limited to 8. We don't go test anything higher in the lab, so I'm just going to roll with that. And then I just plug everything else into my equation, and I end up getting that the minimum required lap length of number 11 hooked bars is about 21 inches. Okay, so that's pretty short, uh, but the question then in VDOT's mind was, well, how would that have compared if we had just redone everything with straight bars, right? And so you can actually go ahead and redo this design, but use AASHTO, which would have been, you know, the bridge code that would have applied for this. That would have been the straight bar lap splice design. And see so what ended up landing at about 56 inches. So if you want to use straight bars for these joints, you got to have 56 inch long splice. You want to go to hook bars, 21 inches. So it seems like VDOT was right in their heuristic reasoning. Um, and it ended up being that for their detail, I think they ended up using about 28 inches. So they were still conservative, which I think was good for them to hear. Um, but it ended up being that after all this said and done, it ended up working out. So just the main conclusion from today is just we've learned is hook bar lap splices uh, resist forces through an in-plane strut and tie mechanism composed of diagonal compression struts and transverse tension ties. We looked at using all the AASHTO, two app versions of AASHTO and ACI 318 to detail these splices and found they were lacking somewhat. And then we developed our own equation that seemed to be able to real, uh, do that well, um, figure out how long those splices need to be with a coefficient of variation of approximately 7%, which I've been told is decent. So anyway, that's about it. If there's any questions I can take at this time, that would be great.